Good morning. Um, this is a text of a joint press conference by two civil society organizations on the conviction of Miriam Sander. Uh, and I want to just go straight to it. You are all aware of the recent uh, high profile Abuja High Court decision that convicted uh, Miriam for allegedly killing the husband. That is a matter that I want to address. Gentlemen of the media, it is with a deep concern and a high sense of responsibility that we have called this press conference to address the matters arising from the judgment which convicted Mariam Sander on charges of culpable homicide following the death of her husband, Bilia Minu Bello. May so rest in peace. However, before we proceed with discussing the issues, I enjoin us all to rise to pay respect to the disease so that we just observe a minute silence. So, departed, rest in peace. Please be seated. Last Monday, His Lordship Justice Yusuf Haliru of the Abuja High Court convicted Miriam for the death of her husband based on circumstantial evidence, whereas it is the law of this nation that the charge of murder or culpable homicide must be proven beyond reasonable doubt. We feel that it is curious why a judge would trifle with an offense of culpable homicide which attracts the death penalty by choosing to draw conclusions of guilt of Miriam based on hearsay. We must point out that no witness testified to seeing Miriam stabbing her husband. No, no murder weapon was tendered by the police in evidence. No confessional statement was made by Miriam or anyone else for that matter. And no two and no two of the six police witnesses corroborated each other's testimonies to the fact that Miriam killed her husband. So what evidence we asked, what evidence is the Honorable Justice Haliru relied on to convict Miriam apart from circumstantial evidence? Gentlemen, we want you to help us ask this question. This is not the position of the law. The law is that no person shall be convicted for offense of murder which attracts capital punishment based on circumstantial evidence. In fact, it was the evidence of all the police witnesses that none of them knew exactly what and who killed Guilherme. However, the prosecution witness one, Ibrahim Ahmed, and Miriam agreed that she had a serious quarrel, fought with Guilherme, whom it took a knife from three times when she wielded it against her husband. In his evidence, he did not say on any of the three occasions that he took the knife from Miriam. He got caught. No. What does that suggest? It simply means she did not plan to hurt anyone at all. More, talk more of her husband, whom she loved jealously. Yes, she was jealous. Yes, she was angry. But if she did not hurt the prosecution witness one, who is her husband's friend, when he got the knife from her on three occasions, how could she have planned to kill her husband, her beloved husband? Anyway, focusing on the judgment of the court, it is our unequivocal view that Justice Haliru breached the letters and process of the law in reaching a decision to convict Miriam Sander on the charge of taking her husband's life. Miriam had filed a preliminary objection challenging the competence of the charge and the jurisdiction of the court to try her. But the judge misdirected himself by refusing to even deliver a ruling on that application. Instead, he treated Miriam's preliminary objection with disregard and 
proceeded to deliver his judgment. This action by the judge has denied the judgment of any legitimacy because it is tantamount to abuse of due and lawful process. If properly weighed, that decision to ignore Miriam's objection shows prejudicial sentiments and bias of the judge against the accused and amounts to amounts to amounts to her being denied her constitutional right to fair hearing, uh, which is captured in section 36, subsection 5. The judge committed what we may call a fatal error when he failed to consider the preliminary objection and rule on it one way or the other before delivering his judgment. We advise them to make this a number one ground of appeal as we believe it is a settled principle in our law that without fair hearing, a proceeding is flawed and incurably defective. We sympathize with the Honorable Courts for having the unavoidable task of making a decision without substantial evidence and blame the police for doing a very shoddy investigation. The failure of the police to do a better job should not be an excuse for the judge to descend from his exalted bench, to assume the role of an investigating police officer by going outside evidence before the court to reach a decision to convict Miriam. As is always the case, we've always been told in most of uh, these um, higher courts, particularly the Supreme Court, who had a lot of uh, presiding Supreme Court justices telling litigants that the court is not a Father Christmas. And then we ask, was the Abuja High Court, did it play a Father Christmas role on this particular matter? Specifically on page 76 of this judgment, Justice Haliru held, and I quote, I have a duty trust upon me to investigate and discover what in any particular case will satisfy the interests and demands of justice. The judge clearly misdirected himself and assumed the position of an IPO, investigating police officer, whereas the only job he was paid to do was to look at the various body of evidence tendered before him and evaluate them critically to reach a determination. This is a good ground for the lady, the accused, who is languishing in jail to file an appeal. Gentlemen, I want to call on my partner, seated by my left, uh, Ms. Mary Ogochugu Anefuna, the Advocacy Lead of Society for Civic Education and Gender, to assist us complete the, the rest of the statement. <laughs> To look critically at that judgment, and uh, because our tax as human rights promoters is to ensure that no life is taken unjustifiably. Section 33, subsection 1 is quite clear on the right to life. To us, we see the right to life as a very serious uh, tax. So for a judge to preside over a matter that has to do with taking the life of the accused, the judge must be seen to have done justice to the matter totally, not just substantially, but absolutely. And we feel that there are areas that were not uh, covered. As you know, the question of preliminary objection goes to the core of the matter before the court. 
if you appear before a judge and the first prayer you ask the judge is, I don't even believe in the competency of this charge against me. I want it thrown out of the window. The court is obliged constitutionally to listen to you before it will take a total view of the entire uh, matter. In fact, in those days, apart from maybe when the administration of criminal justice came into being in 2015 or so, most judges will ordinarily listen to preliminary objection and rule on it before proceeding to the substantial matter. But now it's like judges prefer to combine all, all of it. But before you give your considered ruling, judgments, that we, as we call it, we that are outside the, the, the bar, before you give your judgment, you are expected as a judge to have sufficiently tackled all the matters that arose during the uh, pendency of such a matter, including, most importantly, preliminary objection. It's called preliminary because you have to, you have to look at it. If a preliminary objection has merit, that ends the case. If it doesn't have merit and the judge makes such a pronouncement, you have to proceed to hear, I mean to now decide. If the judge had already decided that all the, all the, all the, all the uh, uh, prayers should be taken, everything about the matter should be taken at once, it is incumbent on the judge to rule on the preliminary objection. And if this is not done, as we observe in the judgment, which I think maybe the media house should endeavor to get the judgment and uh, publicize so that Nigerians can read, because it has become a very serious matter. You ask, what is our own take? Do you know that the, the number three citizen of the country is even involved, is even, has even spoken about this matter? For those of you who cover National Assembly must have heard that the Senate President said the reason why the court may not have looked at the issue of the child, the little child that was carried, the emotional angle to it, you know, is because the, the court does not consider whether they say the, uh, uh, the, the, the court will not say, let us mitigate the sanction that will be applied based on the fact that there is a little baby who needs to be taken care of. Why I'm, why I'm bringing this matter up is because to tell you that this matter has already generated a national momentum, it's something that is already has built a life of its own. And as concerned citizens, as people who are in the human rights sector, who, although some of us, some of us may not necessarily be canvassers of the abolition of the death penalty, so many of us believe that the death penalty should be abolished. I'm talking of the civil society community now in Nigeria. So, but our major interest is that, for the sake of humanity, before you take a decision that we take the life of a citizen, everything that has to do with that matter must be addressed. You should not leave any room for doubt or any room for kind of, uh, um, yeah, for doubt. There shouldn't be any room for certainty. There has to be. A, a real determination. Um, well, I think the, it is not left for the, the, the appellate court to now look at it and take a very total, uh, you know, a decision on this matter. But I believe that the lady will not just uh, sit back and accept the death penalty. I believe that she is going to appeal, if for nothing, at least for the sake of her, her children, she will appeal to the, the court. But our job here is that to tell Nigerians that that judgment is faulty. Substantially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.